I'd like to begin with a story about a family man. This 36-year-old is a devoted father of five, and aside from being a stay-at-home dad, he runs a furniture business where he sells his homemade furniture. He makes it a priority to unite his family on Christmas Eve every year to visit his father-in-law, who unfortunately suffers from poor health. Additionally, he, his wife is a doctor who has been practicing medicine for over a decade. This man is Adam Johnson. He was one of 2,000 rioters who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. After being identified by this viral photo, he was sentenced to 75 days in prison, 200 hours of community service, and $5,000 fine. Now, Adam's story is not an anomaly. In fact, veterans and construction workers alike were involved in the insurrection that led to 115 injuries and seven casualties. The Seattle Police Department and a Maryland print shop were among several companies who prosecuted their own employees for their involvement in the insurrection. Now, what could have warranted this collective act of violence? What could have brought these upstanding citizens to commit such a heinous violation of dem democracy? These questions piqued my interest in 2020, and I began to explore the social justice movements at the time, as well as the surge of social media activism. Teens can attest to reposting graphic after graphic, demonstrating our collective demand for social reform. I'd like to share a few of the Instagram posts I circulated now that demonstrate the progression of this movement. First, the Black Lives Matter movement, which brought about concerns of police reform, police brutality, as well as systemic racism. Then we can look towards the women's rights movement, which demanded abortion rights, as well as widespread recognition for cases of assault. Then the Asian hate movement, which talked about the hate crimes we directed at Asian Americans, as well as the fetishization of Asian women. Now, how many of you have seen posts like this on the web? I too have, and this, these numerous amounts of posts are those that I have circulated myself. And as I pulled up these old posts in preparation for this talk, I had two major realizations. First, my social network, we're all reposting the same ideologically aligned graphics. We were entrenched in our own massive echo chamber without any opposing political views. Unbeknownst to us, the same calls to slash police funding sparked national partisan hostility, and abortion debates were dividing even nuclear families. My second realization was that I was reposting fewer graphics from movement to movement a trend reflected in broader politics, as we saw protests die down and with them diplomatic and media attention. But why was this happening if none of the social issues were being solved? Was it instead that we had become fatigued by lacking results in clashing disputes? Today, our politics is plagued with mutual distrust, hostility, and aggression. 80% of us have negative feelings towards our partisan foes, and many even refuse to socialize across party lines. We accept smaller paychecks, move home locations, swipe left on dating sites, and even shop in different grocery stores to avoid our political opponents. And as demonstrated by the Capitol insurrection, political intolerance extends 
all the way to violence. To illustrate this further, just last month, Republican Councilwoman Eunice Jumpful was shot dead in her SUV outside of her home. The month before, a Republican New Jersey House of Representatives nominee, Solomon Pena, orchestrated a series of drive-by shootings at the homes of Democratic officials. Political scientists theorized that a system where affective polarization erodes democratic principles and willingness to compromise in this way could threaten the stability of American democracy and even engender a second civil war. Now that I've terrified everyone, is there a solution? Is polarization reversible? Some behavioral research is optimistic, finding that our mutual hostility stems from a belief that we are ideologically incongruent, but in fact, we agree far more than we think. Stunningly, about 80% of Americans agree on the broad strokes of abortion, gun control, and immigration legislation. The reason for an intolerance is instead the prevalence of negative meta-perceptions. Five years ago, an Australian economist and American psychologist came together to test how well Americans understand opposing parties' viewpoints. On the statement, properly controlled immigration can be good. 33% more Republicans agreed than Democrats had predicted. And on the statement, I am proud to be an American, 28% more Democrats agreed than Republicans had predicted. But not only do we fail to understand the policy preferences of our opponents, we also fail to have any clue what they think about us. Across 10,000 participants and 26 countries, researchers found that individuals strongly overestimate the political opponent's hatred of our co-partisans and co-partisans' hatred towards our political opponents. In other words, both parties are far less polarized than we think. So how can we utilize this information to change a culture of antipathy? Well, a decade ago, two researchers sent volunteers to South Florida to target anti-transgender prejudice. These volunteers went door to door talking to residents. And what they found was that transphobia was reduced substantially, even after participants were exposed to counter arguments. Essentially, these researchers were able to depolarize a very polarized issue simply by having a conversation, demonstrating that tolerant and respectful discourse with people of different ideologies are key to overturning our distorted beliefs. In other words, the simplest way to tackle political divisions is through discourse. But political conversations can go awry in a number of ways, which is why it is essential to look to ourselves and ask, Am I the problem? And if so, what can be done to overcome my own intolerance? First is self-awareness. Some fun brain science tells us that if I were to split you all in half into a blue group and a red group and ask you to compete, within milliseconds, you would start to feel pleasure at the pain of your opponents. And if I were to take one person from the red team, move you to the blue team, your brain would recalibrate to feel pain at the pleasure of your original team members. This demonstrates that these tendencies of an us and them mindset are very prevalent in all aspects of our lives. However, self-reflection can be essential, the first step to overcoming these tendencies. Ask yourself, do I pride myself on unwavering adherence to ideals or on tireless loyalty towards a political party? And if so, this may warrant further reflection into your own personal ideologies as well as political goals. The second way to overcome intolerance is humility. Raise your hand if you've won a political argument against someone in your family. What about two? How about all of them? 
who am I kidding? I live in a family of five, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and in all seriousness, there's no way for us all to win 100% of arguments or even 80% or even 60%. Statistically, that doesn't add up. Instead, we can approach contention with humility. A study noted that people with higher intellectual humility feel warmer towards those who are both politically and religiously different from their own because they're able to pay attention to the reasons behind those beliefs and also evaluate when evidence for their own political beliefs is limited. Many of us may only engage in with a political opponent in conversation to prove them wrong or educate them on the truth. Instead, we can confront our own shortcomings and those of our political party. The funny thing about tribalism is we can actually use it to our advantage. People are highly attuned to popularity. We want to fit in, and thus we'll look to our co-partisans to see what it takes to be in the in-group. This means that if politicians and voters alike stand up to say, I am against polarized language and actions, we can change our political culture. Lastly, empathy is key to overcoming intolerance. If you've ever labeled someone as lazy when you're receiving subpar service, instead of realizing they need to be managing demanding personal issues or other tasks, you're not entirely a cold-hearted monster. In fact, a social psychology tendency dubbed the fundamental attribution error finds that we are prone to attributing others' actions to their character traits rather than their existing external forces. In politics, this may mean characterizing groups of people as purely evil or purely ignorant based on their political ideology, instead of evaluating the experiences that shape their values. We don't need to have a political conversation with a disliked group to foster compassion. Instead, studies find that we can imagine the disliked group in an empathetic way, and this immediately reduces malicious beliefs about that group. In the transgender prejudice study, for example, they asked residents to remember a time when they had been judged. And in both Europe and America, story that simply linked immigrants to cultural issues, like food, rather than border crossing, decreased negative attitudes substantially, while stories that linked immigrants to crime polarized. We cannot ignore the fact that polarization exists today. And while ideally actions contribute to polarization, the solution can be equally personal. We can change the trajectory of our political culture beginning with you and me. We can self-reflect to evaluate our own intolerances and biases. We can have humility calling out ourselves and our own political party. <coughs> and we can foster empathy by constantly humanizing others' experiences and evaluating external factors. We all have differences, but the future depends on us finding common ground with those we disagree with. Now we've all heard the idiom, maybe in another life. Maybe in another life I would live in Florida. Maybe in another life I would be friends with this person. Well ask yourself, would you be friends with capital storming Adam? Would you be friends with loving father Adam? Or businessman Adam? We can no longer separate people's political ideologies from themselves, but we can evaluate the external factors and experiences shaping them. Let's shift the narrative by practicing communication and empathy to make the world a better place in this life. So are we the problem? Yes. But can we be the solution? Let's collectively say it. Yes. 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 Thank you.